Our Father God, we thank you that you're a God who speaks to tell us what you're like, to explain the things you've done. And we thank you that you've had your words written down for us in the Bible. And we pray that you would speak to us now through them. Please, would we not just hear these as dry, old words from an old book, but by your spirit, would you help us to understand, to see the truth of what you say and to see you more clearly so that our faith in you grows. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We could ask all the Christians here this morning, what do you get out of being a Christian? Or for those of us here looking into Christianity, we could ask, why are you interested in God and in Jesus? What do you think Christianity might have to offer you? And between us all, I think we'd probably hear various different answers. In one sense, the Bible is very clear about what we're being offered. God is offering us himself. The story of us and God in simple terms is that God made us and we've rejected him and God loves us and wants us back. That's why Jesus is at the very center of Christianity, isn't it? He is the son of God come into his own creation as a human to bring people back into relationship with him, back into relationship with his father. And what we make of that offer will depend on what we make of the God who makes it. The book of Exodus, which we're spending time in in our Sunday mornings, is written so that we'll see more of what God is like and more of the salvation that he offers. God offers the biggest rescue imaginable. In Exodus itself, it's a rescue of ancient Israel from slavery in ancient Egypt several thousand years ago. But he is the same God now as he was then. And what God is doing in this bit of the Bible story is just a small version of his great big cosmic rescue plan through his son, Jesus Christ. Though it's worth noting, isn't it, that by the end of our reading this morning, God's rescue does not look all that successful or amazing. God has sent Moses and Aaron to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, and it looks like they're going in with a strong negotiating hand, because in a previous chapter we heard Pharaoh ask, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And this time God has sent Moses in with a validating miracle. Verse 9, look at verse 9, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So like we ask for a gas man's ID card, Pharaoh asks for a miracle to prove that Moses really speaks for God, he's really from God. And they've got a miracle to give him. Verse 10, Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Incredible. Except the miracle is not enough for Pharaoh, is it? His magicians managed to do a kind of a copy of the Lord's show of strength. They make snakes from staffs too. Those get eaten by Aaron's snake. I don't know whether those magicians are just people who can do clever tricks or whether they've got some kind of evil spiritual power, but it doesn't make much difference, I don't think. The important point is how Pharaoh responds to God's show of power. Verse 13, yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So Pharaoh is not going to let the Jewish people go. And this is exactly the outcome that Moses was fearing. Look back up to chapter 6, verse 30, close to the beginning of our reading. Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Well, he hasn't listened. Disaster, surely. Except that things are a bit stranger than that, aren't they? Pharaoh wouldn't listen just as the Lord had said, it tells us. God knew that this would happen. And God didn't just know that this would happen. He intended it to happen. Look at chapter 7, verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. God is doing this deliberately. 
He has hardened Pharaoh's heart, specifically so that Pharaoh would refuse the very thing that God was asking of him. Why would he do that? Why would God do that? In fact, before we think about why God would do that, I reckon it's worth thinking what exactly it is that he's done. What does it mean that God hardened Pharaoh's heart? It's not that God overrules Pharaoh's humanity and makes him into nothing more than a robot. Pharaoh makes a real human choice to reject the Lord. In the coming chapters, we'll see Pharaoh hard-hearted again and again, and sometimes we'll be told that God felt hardened Pharaoh's heart, and sometimes we'll be told that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And it's really important to see that those aren't two different things. The language is used interchangeably because they're both, at the same time, true descriptions of what is going on. Pharaoh is making a real human choice to reject God, but it's nevertheless under God's complete control and even part of his plans and purposes. It really is true that Pharaoh hardens his heart, and it's just as true that God hardens it. As confusing as this is for humans to get our heads around, the Bible holds those two things together all the time. God is utterly sovereign over everything all the time. I can't make any choice that is outside of God's wonderful plans and purposes and control. And yet, I make real choices for which I'm really responsible. The Bible, I don't think, ever explains how those two things go together. It never explains how God can both be in complete control and at the same time make us real people with real choices who are not just robots. And yet it insists that our God is big and that both those things are true. Some of us saw a classic example, didn't we, at the end of Genesis a few months ago. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, the Bible says both that it was God's plan so that Joseph would be able to save many lives And it was also a real choice made by Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery. Both God and Joseph's brothers intended Joseph to become a slave. God was in control even of the brothers' hearts, and God was working everything for good. But Joseph's brothers weren't robots. They were making real choices, and their choices were evil. What does that mean for what we're seeing here in Exodus? It means that on the one hand, we can ask why Why is Pharaoh hardening his heart to God? But we can't stop there because God is clear to Moses that he himself will harden hearts. And that's much more mysterious. Why does God want Pharaoh to refuse his own demand? If God wants to rescue people from Egypt, why make it harder? It's an important question, isn't it? What good purpose does God have to make Israel's salvation so difficult? And the beginnings of the answer are in verse 5. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's how he began his speech to Moses, right at the end of chapter 6, verse 29. I am the Lord. Whenever the Bible says the Lord like that in capital letters... It's shorthand for God's name. Those of you who were with us when we were in chapter 3 will remember that when Moses wanted to know who God was, what he was like, he asked him for his name. And God told him it was this, I am who I am. And on one level, that doesn't seem to tell us all that much about what God is actually like. But when God wants us to know him, he doesn't stop at giving us his name. In a sense, the whole of Exodus is an explanation of what God's name means. And so throughout the book, you hear the phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord. When I've done this, when they've watched what I've done and they've seen what I'm like, then they'll know that I am the Lord. And that is key to why God is hardening Pharaoh's heart and preparing to make this rescue from Egypt have to be an absolutely massive one. If Pharaoh had just let Israel go, then the Israelites could easily have given Moses the credit, or even Pharaoh the credit, I suppose. They wouldn't have learnt as much, I don't think, about their awesome God. But the Exodus isn't about Moses the skillful diplomat, or Pharaoh the benevolent ruler, far from it. It's about God the great rescuer. And it's only this kind of rescue that shows us what God is really like. 
and sets the pattern for the ultimate rescue that he's going to do through his son Jesus. Listen again to what God says he's going to do so that we'll see the kind of God he is and the shape of the salvation that he brings. Verse 3 to 5. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring out my divisions, my people the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. You and I don't need saving from slavery in ancient Egypt, but God has designed the shape of this salvation to teach us the kind of God he is, and so the kind of salvation that he can give to us. And I think there are two big things to notice about the kind of God he is, the kind of rescue he is. And the first is that he is a God of powerful justice. It's unmissable, isn't it, in what he says to Moses, I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. It's going to be even more unmissable in the coming chapters when the Lord will send ten plagues against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. This is a God who judges. Sometimes people talk as if God's love and his judgment are two quite different parts of his character. He's loving, but he also judges. Well, that's not how it is at all. He's loving, and so he judges. Love and anger aren't opposites. To love is to fiercely oppose evil. It's a vital part of love. If I don't care when evil is done to you, then I do not love you. Imagine a God who can look at the suffering we humans inflict on each other and do nothing about it. Imagine a God who is okay with human selfishness, who doesn't mind when we lie to each other, who can turn a blind eye to sexual abuse, to hurtful speech, to whatever human evil that we might mention, big or small. A God without justice is the opposite of a loving God. God is infinitely loving, and so he's utterly just. Pretty much everyone, I think, hates injustice to some extent at least. We hate it when it's even merely a trivial injustice, like a sports person getting away with some outrageous cheating. And if you're like me, then you moan at the TV or you shout at the referee. Injustice should be dealt with. And if that's true in sport, how much more true is it in a world so impacted by human selfishness and pride? We need a God who can end all evil. And that's who God is about to show himself to be against Pharaoh in Egypt. So far in Exodus, the Jewish people have faced at the hands of the Egyptians the genocide of their sons and harsh slavery and prolonged suffering. And God has brought Israel to a place of oppression by an evil power in part so that they can see him judge. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and with mighty acts of judgment I will bring you out. In one sense, God's judgment proves that he's the God who can save. The story of human history is heading towards something wonderful. A perfect kingdom where God rules. A new creation like the universe we live in now, but a place of love. And that could only happen if God can end all evil. In that sense, judgment is necessary for salvation. Only once all evil has been destroyed can we have salvation? One of, the, one of the TV shows that I enjoy watching is Foyle's War. Has anyone watched Foyle's War? Foyle is a Second World War uh, police detective, and he's brilliant. And I like him because, though people usually underestimate him, he always brings justice. People are always trying to intimidate him. They always think that they can escape justice, but Foyle is unflappable. He never backs down. His is a justice that seemingly can't be stopped, except, at least where I'm up to in the series, once. When Foyle was prevented from arresting a cold-blooded murderer because he happened to be keen to 
uh, getting some aeroplanes off the Americans that were vital to the war effort. And so Foyle was told he had to let him go. Something bigger meant justice couldn't come. And it was a much less cheerful episode than normal. It was deeply unsatisfying to see Foyle outranked in his pursuit of justice. But God cannot be outranked when it comes to justice. God's justice really is unstoppable. That's one of the things he's trying to show us throughout the Exodus story. One of the reasons that he hardens Pharaoh's heart, that ruler of that great big superpower, however big the enemy, however much he resists, God will end all evil. Seeing the power of God's judgment reassures us about that perfect future. God's judgment, his his judgment proves that he's the God who can save. But his judgment also, I think, makes us ask how we can be saved. Because we are not perfect, are we? If you're a Christian here this morning, then you know your own evil very well. Surely justice for you and me doesn't look like spending eternity with God. Well, we need to see the second thing that God is showing us about himself, because he's not only a God of powerful justice, but a God of powerful salvation, salvation even for people like you and me. Look at how keen God is to show his power to save. He's arranged things so that he's got all of Egypt's strength focused on keeping Israel in slavery. And God is going to bring Israel out. Amazing. God could bring them out of Egypt easily. But he wants to do it, we're told, with an outstretched arm. I love that picture. God's control and power is so much that he could just kind of twitch his finger, barely move a muscle, and get Israel out of Egypt, no problem. He could make Pharaoh wake up one morning and just decide to let Israel go. But he doesn't want to do it with a flick of a finger. He wants to show the strength of his outstretched arm. I think of it as being a little bit like a high jump competition. At the start of a high jump competition, when the bar is set really low, you can't see easily who the good high jumpers and the bad high jumpers are because they can all just clear the bar. But by the end of the competition, when the bar is at its highest, only the best can jump it. To see the best high jumpers, you set the bar as high as you can. And that is what God is doing when he hardens Pharaoh's heart against him. He is setting the bar as high as he can. He's making their salvation hard enough that we learn the power of God's outstretched arm to save. Why does he need us to know that he can save with real power? Well, it's because if you and I are going to be saved... It won't be a small salvation that does it. Some people come to Christianity looking for a purpose in life or for community or for happiness or security or identity. And God gives all of those things. But the problem we have is bigger than any of them because God saves us from evil. And not just the evil out there. He saves me from the evil in here. We are slaves, God says, to our sin. The preacher at the royal wedding, I don't know if you heard the royal wedding sermon, he said that love is powerful. And he's not wrong in that respect, is he? He tried to paint a picture of what the world would be like if we all loved like Jesus loves. But you might have been listening and thinking, well, the world is never really going to be like that. Because humans are never going to love like that. You only had to see the faces of the people in the service to know they knew that. Because the problem is that none of us can love like Jesus by ourselves. We are held in the grip of sin. No human can wake up tomorrow morning and simply decide never to be selfish again. Never to live as if the world revolves around us. We can't do it. Sin does not simply let us go. Which is why the message of Christianity isn't just follow Jesus' example. It's not sort yourself out and then come to God. Instead, it's an exodus-like salvation. If you're here looking into Christianity, then this is one of the big things to know. What God offers us in Jesus is a salvation that we have no power to get for ourselves. A Christian has no credit compared to a non-Christian. It's not that we are better. There's nothing in us that meant that we are saved and others not. It's all God. That is why you become a Christian, simply by believing in Jesus, trusting in him and accepting him as your saviour. 
when we do that, we put ourselves into the hands of the one who has all the power to save. And that's what the Exodus is supposed to show us. What kind of power does it take to save us, not just from the evil out there, but the evil in here? Well, it's the power that we're going to be remembering together, isn't it, when we share the Lord's Supper later in our service. The God of justice saves people in the grip of sin through the cross of Jesus. Jesus' death is the moment in history when the judgment of the Father fell on his Son. My sin, my judgment, taken by Jesus Christ. How can a God of such justice also be the God of powerful salvation? Well, by the cross, that is how we can be forgiven. God's incredible love can bring justice and salvation at the same time. Look at how amazing God's salvation is. Maybe you're a Christian who doesn't often stop to think about how astonishing God's salvation is. When we read Exodus, we're not supposed to stop at the Exodus. God is trying to show us more of what he is like so that we'll see more of the size of the salvation that he can give us in Jesus. The bar could not have been set higher. Salvation from sin and death and evil. And God has the power to bring us out of sin and death as truly as he brought Israel out of Egypt. As we finish, three brief ways that we might want to respond. First, I think, rejoice. Look at the God of this universe and rejoice at his justice and his salvation. If you're not a Christian, then you could rejoice at it this morning for the first time. This is great news. For those of us who are already Christians, I wonder if we should stop and marvel again at the Lord, who stretches out his hand and saves from evil. Rejoice. And second, entrust your life to him. God is the one with whom we are saved and safe. If we put our lives into Jesus' hands, then our future is guaranteed. Life could be all kinds of rubbish now, couldn't it? It was for the Israelites. But our future is guaranteed, and we truly have nothing to fear. Through Jesus, God has stretched out his hand and saved. So we're free to live our whole lives for him. Third, tell other people, because the God who makes us rejoice is good news not just for the Israelites but for the Egyptians too ultimately and for everyone that we know and everyone else too why don't I pray for us as we finish Father God we thank you for hardening Pharaoh's heart and showing us what you are like we rejoice that you are the one who has power to judge and save. And we thank you so much for stretching out your arm and saving us from sin and death through Jesus Christ. Amen.